Welcome. Last year marked the 80th anniversary of the Woodbury Poetry Room, which began its life in the marbled penthouse floor of Widener Library uh, in 1931, and only moved to its current incarnation at Lamont in 1949, the year that John Ashbery graduated from Harvard. Two years later, Ashbery returned to Cambridge to participate in the first performance of the Poets' Theater, which Fanny and Susan Howe's mother, Mary Manning Howe, helped to found in a series of performances starring Frank O'Hara and Richard Eberhardt, among others. That 1951 recording is now available on our website. Thanks to the two women in the back of the room. <laughs> it was also in 1951 that we made our first recording of Adrian Rich, who passed away last week. When Rich was here at Radcliffe, the poetry room was closed to women. I mention this detail because our esteemed guest today, Karen Rothman, Associate Professor of English at West Point, has recently published a book called From the Modernist Annex, which focuses on women poets who, forced to seek their education outside the walls of American universities, turn to museums and libraries for their own enlightenment. Rothman's current project is tentatively called Young John Ashbery and promises to be the first critical biography of his early life. Rothman's research builds a detailed portrait of Ashbery's intensely productive childhood near Rochester, New York from previously unknown materials, including letters, more than 1,000 pages of childhood diaries, and several notebooks full of juvenilia. Today, we are privileged to have Rothman here to take us on an audio and textual journey through Ashbery's youth, including a discussion of the first two poems he wrote at Harvard, and accompanied by audio from our collection and from our acoustic comrades at Penn Sound. Please welcome Karen Rothman. Thanks so much, um, and thanks to Christina and Chloe so much for inviting me here today. I'm excited to talk about these amazing audio recordings and about my current project, um, which is a biography of John Ashbery's early life from 1927 when he was born in Rochester, New York, through 1955, the year he won the Yale Younger Poets Prize, and for his first official volume um, of poems, Some Trees, and he also left New York that year to live in France on a Fulbright and stayed there for more or less um, the next 10 years. I know I'm not unusual in saying that my experience of Ashbery's poetry completely changed when I heard him read it for the first time. Um, for me, that was about 10 years ago in, in grad school, and it was a kind of momentous moment for me in, in terms of um, thinking and understanding his poetry. And it's pretty astonishing how many of the readings are now available online, um, due very much to the efforts of places like the Woodbury Poetry Room. And it, it's fitting, um, since one of the very first things that Ashbery did when he arrived at Harvard in the summer of 1945 was to make a beeline for that Woodbury Poetry Room in Widener Library that Christina mentioned, um, which, was, uh, which already at the time had probably one of the most exciting collections of poets reading for their own work. And he listened extensively, um, really from the moment he arrived in the summer of 45 on. And it's also the place where he gave his first public poetry reading a couple of years later while he was still an undergraduate. Um, given today's focus on both Ashbery's childhood and audio recordings, I thought I'd begin this talk with Ashbery's extended reflection on childhood and art in The Lone Dale Operator from A Wave in 1984. Ashbery has called this prose poem the first of the first movie poems, staking a claim to the creation of a poetic genre, though my own interest in the poem is really how it thinks about the value of first experiences. Um, the poem, if you happen to have the Library of America with you, it's uh, page 771, otherwise I provided some, or with the help of Chloe and Christina, some handouts. And um, this recording is from Harvard in 1987, and it starts out, as you'll see, with some trouble with the mic, so Next it takes a minute a to get going. Short prose poem or, or piece called The Lone Dale Operator. <laughs> the first movie I ever saw, is it, suddenly it seems as though I, my voice is much louder than women. You know, to me, is there a loose connection or something? Huh? The Lone Dale operator. Now my voice no longer sounds very loud to me, is it? <laughs> I, 
but I assume you can hear me. Okay. The first movie I ever saw was the Walt Disney cartoon, The Three Little Pigs. My grandmother took me to it. It was back in the days when you went downtown. There was a second feature with live actors called Bring Em Back Alive, a documentary about the explorer, Frank Buck. In this film, you saw a python swallow a live pig. This wasn't scary. In fact, it seemed quite normal, the sort of thing you would see in a movie, reality. <laughs> a little later, we went downtown again to see a movie of Alice in Wonderland, also with live actors. This wasn't very surprising either. I think I knew something about the story. Maybe it had been read to me. That wasn't why it wasn't surprising, though. The reason was that these famous movie actors like W.C. Fields and Gary Cooper were playing different roles. And even though I didn't know who they were, they were obviously important for doing other kinds of acting. And so it didn't seem strange that they should be acting in a special way like this, pretending to be characters that people already knew about from a book. In other words, I imagined specialties for them just from having seen this one example. And I was right, too, though not about the film, which I liked. Years later, I saw it when I was grown up and thought it was awful. How could I have been wrong the first time? I knew it was an inexperience because somehow I was experienced the first time I saw a movie. It was as though my taste had changed, though I had not. And I still can't help feeling that I was right the first time when I was still relatively unencumbered by my experience. I forget what were the next movies I saw, and we'll skip ahead to one I saw when I was grown up, The Lone Dale Operator, a silent short by D.W. Griffith, made in 1911 and starring Blanche Sweet. Although I was in my 20s when I saw it at the Museum of Modern Art, it seems as remote from me in time as my first viewing of Alice in Wonderland. I can remember almost none of it, and the little I can remember may have been in another Griffith short, The Lonely Villa, which may have been on the same program. It seems that Blanche Sweet was a heroic telegraph operator who managed to get through to the police and foil some gangsters who were trying to rob a railroad depot. Though I also see this living room, small, though it was supposed to be in a large house, with Mary Pickford running around. And this may have been a scene in the lonely villa. At that moment, the memories stop and terror or tedium sets in. It's hard to tell which is which in this memory because the boredom of living in a lonely place or having a lonely job, and even of being so far in the past and having to wear those funny, uncomfortable clothes and hairstyles is terrifying, more so than the intentional scariness of the plot, the criminals, whoever they were. Imagine that Innocence, Lillian Harvey, encounters romance, Willie Fritch, in the home of experience, Albert Basserman. From there, it is only a step to terror under the dripping boughs outside. Anything can change as fast as it wants to, and in doing so may pass through a more or less terrible phase, but the true terror is in the swiftness of changing, forward or backward, slipping always just beyond our control. The actors are like people on drugs, though they aren't doing anything unusual. As a matter of fact, they're performing brilliantly. I should point out that those names, Lillian Harvey, Willie Fritsch, and Albert Bassman are names of actors who were popular in German films in the 1930s. So I just, I'm going to just talk briefly about this poem, um, about the opening description of watching a movie. A first movie as a young kid with his grandmother leads him to the question asked in the second half of the second paragraph. Is our first experience of art the right one? Or do we need to learn things to develop our sense of taste? The poem analyzes how aesthetic understanding takes shape in the mind as one learns more, yet the poem is unwilling to discount first experience. The speaker moves back and forth in his mind, trying to figure out when his aesthetic sense was more correct. As an imaginative, intuitive child, seeing Alice in Wonderland as the second or third movie of his life and loving it, or as the more knowing adult realizing that the movie was, in fact, no good at all. So the, the quote, I was right too, though not about the film, which I liked. But if he wasn't right about the quality of the film, then what is it that he's right about? 
Years later, when he sees Alice in Wonderland a second time and thinks it's awful, he can't still discount the reaction of his younger self. Quote, I still can't help feeling that I was right the first time when I was still relatively unencumbered by my, my experience. The poem refuses to choose which reaction in the film is the better one. Both have value. But the early memory is part of a larger process of understanding of what art might be. For what the young moviegoer is right about is his instinctive understanding, the very first time he sees a live action film, that the reality he sees on screen is the film's reality, that is art, and he can accept and enjoy the movie on those terms in a way the trained older self can't. The poem temporarily leaves the issue of the child's precocious instinct to ruminate on the problem of growing up at the end of the poem, how terrifying it is that things change so quickly. Movies, both his memory of going to see them and even what he forgets or conflates about what he saw, provide some comfort in part because they help him locate and fix his experience in a particular time and place. Or, as Ashbery puts this sim a similar idea at the end of the well-known poem, Soonest Mended, another extended reflection on childhood and growing up. One is, quote, always coming back to the mooring of starting out that day so long ago. And he used part of that quote um, as the title for one of his for the book of his first five books of poetry, so he was sort of attached to it. In these poems, and repeatedly in Ashbery poems since then, someday in the past, so long ago, serves as a mooring, an anchor, from which later experience can be grounded, compared, and understood. So for the next 30 minutes or so, I want to talk about the period and the concerns um, these poems are so occupied with, which is also the period of my biography of Ashbery's early life, the relationship between understanding art and life that Ashbery began to work out quite unconsciously by the age of 13, that he came to some quite conscious conclusions about while trying to improve his poems while at Harvard, and that he has continued to mine as a subject of some of his most moving, open, and personal poetry since the 1970s. To do this, I want to return to a few specific days in Ashbery's childhood and look at how they serve as examples of the sorts of anchors the Lowndale operator employs and that Soonest Mended refers to, locatable origins of feeling that he can turn back to later on, forgetting their specifics but remembering a sense of them, the repetitiousness, dullness, stillness, silliness, not only to rediscover his poetic and personal origins, but also as an intensely renewable source of creativity and imagination. To do this, I'm turning to the four complete diaries he kept from the ages of 13 to 16. Um, he kept other diaries later on in his life for a month or two here and there, but never as consistently or as thoroughly as he did during this period. I should mention that I discovered the existence of these diaries about three years ago at Ashbury's home in upstate New York when I was working there. And um, they're, they're small, neat, leather-bound books. And as Christina mentioned, they total about 1,000 pages. Um, and he gave me permission to read, to read and write about them at the time. Ashbury began keeping them. And, and by the way, he hadn't looked at them in, in 60 years. Um, so he, he really sort of remembered a sense of them, but not, not the specifics. Um, Ashbury began keeping them in January 1941, after receiving the first one as a gift from his mother. But he kept up the writing not only of this one, but of the three subsequent ones, which he handpicked himself. He was extremely disciplined and consistent about writing in, in them. Um, and it, so much so, by the way, that there are six loose pages of his diaries that ended up in the Houghton Library because he lost it and he kept writing even though he didn't have them. And so they ended up in his papers there because um, they got separated from the diary. Uh, so he wrote them from 1941 until February 1944 um, when he gave it up because the, the diary by, by that point had become a kind of distraction from the poetic writing he most wanted to be doing. For the first three years of diary keeping, Ashbury wrote his daily entries either in his bedroom at his parents' farm in Sotus, New York, a rural community 30 miles from Rochester, or in his grandparents' bedroom um, where, where he had a bedroom six miles away in the tiny, very picturesque village of Pulteneyville which looked out onto the expansive sea-like view of Lake Ontario. Ashbury was especially close to his grandparents, his mother's parents, who lived in Pulneyville, especially his rather Victorian grandfather, Henry Lawrence, who was born in 1864 and died actually nine, exactly 90 years later, um, and who comes across in family letters as extremely charming and erudite. He was the first chair of the physics department at the University of Rochester, a position he held for 40 years until retiring to Pulteneyville. Ashbury went to school in Sodus and helped on his family's 75-acre fruit farm, where his father grew apples, plums, cherries, raised turkeys, and for a short period of time kept a pig barn. But he spent just about every moment he could, almost every weekend and entire summer, staying in Pulteneyville with his grandparents, running around with a close group of summer friends on the beach there, building sandcastles, swimming. 
In the winter, when fewer kids were around, Ashbury stayed inside, painted or sketched, read from his grandfather's extensive collection of 19th century poetry and English novels, and observed the wild, fantastic waves outside the window, which he noted in the diaries. I want to return to this period to look at an unremarkable day, Wednesday, February 19th, 1941. And yet, because the 13-year-old Ashbury had committed himself to a project of diary keeping, he's going to write about it anyway. It's the 50th day of 1941, and it's his 50th entry. And he's already quite annoyed and apologetic to the diary about how dull his life is and how little he has to write about, which is, I'm sure anybody who's kept a diary feels that way. Yet, I, it's a sort of exciting entry. It's one of my favorites because he transforms his complaints about his boring life into something much more interesting by the form in which he writes about it. So here's the entry. Quote, Wednesday, written on Wednesday. Today, Wednesday. The weather was extremely blizzardous. The day seemed so much like Wednesday. At noon, I walked uptown even though the weather was blizzardous. I think I mentioned that before. I made up the social studies, which was given on the Friday I was absent, 92%. The marks in Latin test yesterday were very poor, but I managed to get 100%. For dessert tonight, we had a seal test ice cream, cherry pie, a real treat. After supper, I started to illustrate Poe's hot frog, but I didn't get on very well. I listened to Eddie Cantor, Wednesday, Wednesday. I'm feeling silly today, blizzardous, written, oh, definitely, on Wednesday. This entry has so much of his distinctive poetic voice already clearly in it, even though he's only 13 and has written only one poem in his life so far. It's almost a first prose poem. Um, for it includes details of his daily life and then produces a feeling about those details. It's written as a complaint, but the technique to document the unchanging nature of his life is so whimsically repetitious that a tone of weariness and joy is simultaneously produced. This entry illuminates a new relationship between life and writing, as writing about the annoyance of life produces a feeling of pleasure, an interrelatedness that is new and significant for him. And if one of the exciting parts of this entry is its total lack of self-consciousness in its experimentation, then it is also interesting that the very next day, the 51st entry in the diary, Ashbury writes for the first time and still with no self-consciousness nor any fanfare at all that he knows he's going to become an artist. Here's the entry for February 20th, 1941. Quote, overslept this morning as usual. The noon, this noon, the wind blew a veritable gale, but I braved the storm. The class discussion of the social studies chapter turned out to be a dizzy review of the first few pages. I'm writing a theme on my future occupation, artist. It must be at least 1,000 words long. I must have nearly 1,000 already. In Latin, I seem to be the only one who understands pronouns and eye stems. I got a painful scratch on the writer. Pardon, listening to the radio. I mean, a scratch on the finger. It hurt me terribly. Oh, quite. I had no homework. I am making more pose illustrations, and I think I shall show them to Miss Cook tomorrow. The declaration that he is, quote, writing a theme on my future occupation artist occurs in the middle of an entry about things, lots of things, just as his idea of becoming an artist is surrounded by and emerges within the details of a regular day. In this initial mention of the idea of becoming an artist, the word artist is in parentheses. Perhaps the parentheses suggest that he isn't totally comfortable identifying himself as an artist yet, but more likely he knows he will become an artist but isn't sure yet what kind. Um, at the end of the entry, he mentions showing his illustrations of Poe stories to Miss Cook. She was his favorite art teacher of several good ones at the Memorial Art Gallery a really stunning museum in Rochester where he attended weekly classes for several years and also did a fair amount of just wandering around and looking at art in the beautiful galleries. While Ashbury might have been thinking about becoming a painter or a novelist at this point, he was not yet seriously thinking about becoming a poet. In 1941, he was writing lots of beginnings of novels, composing short stories, sending original plays, mostly melodramatic mysteries, which he would write in installments and send one to somebody just so that they'd send him a letter back so that they could get the next part of the story. Um, and uh, he had written only one poem at this point, a very amusing one dashed off at age eight called The Battle, um, about an epic fight. And uh, just to give you a taste of his instinctive and entertaining early style, here's the third stanza, which is the climax of the poem. The battle's beginning, it's a fight to the end. The rabbits pitch in, some help they must lend. The bushes are conquered. Well, that was short. <laughs> How shall they celebrate their victory? Well, my dears, that's a long story. He wrote that poem in 1935, and it received some family acclaim. Um, but then it wasn't until the end of 1941 that he wrote any new poems. Um, in 1942, he wrote a, a few more. By the spring of 1943, he had given up his novel in progress. And other than painting, which he was still doing quite seriously, he was writing poems, more poems than anything else. Albeit they were extremely short, 
Um, but he was so determined to write good poems that he occasionally skipped school to stay home and write. Early in 1944, he decided that he would become a poet, and he never, ever wavered from that decision. Um, it's during this three-year period between his decision to become an artist on February 20th, 1941, and his statement of a commitment to poetry as the art form he would devote himself to, which happened on February 24th, 19, 20, 1944, that one can really see him working through some new ideas about what poetry is and how he wants to write it. Artistic ideas that occur to him in the context of his daily life as he goes to school and church and does farm chores, which he despises, and lies in bed listening to the radio, gets told by his parents to go outside and get some exercise, which he also isn't fond of, and enumerates details about his shifting social and emotional life. The thoughts that begin to emerge in his diary about writing lead him to state what I'd call his earliest principles of poetry, ideas especially focused on the issue of to what degree an artist ought to include details of his own life in a work of art, a subject that the difficult experience of trying to write about the details of his life each day in the diary as a, basically a, as a kind of writing exercise made central for him and enabled him to also keep tabs on the way that he was thinking about this issue. So I want to pause this narrative briefly to listen to Ashbery's 1978 Harvard reading of Worsening Situation, the second poem from Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror. Both the poem itself and his brief funny remarks after he reads it are about this issue of art and autobiography that he was already thinking about so much as a young kid. And that reel, by the way, is the reel from that, that reading. Um, so here's the poem. I'll, I'm going to start with a uh, poem from uh, my book, Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror, which someone asked me to read. And uh, read several from the Houseboat Days, the most recent book. And then I, I'm going to read some recent poems that haven't been published. And I'll read for a, a, about an hour. <clears throat> Worsening situation. Like a rainstorm, he said, the braided colors wash over me and are no help. Or like one at a feast who eats not, for he cannot choose from among the smoking dishes. This severed hand stands for life and wander as it will, east or west, north or south. It is ever a stranger who walks beside me. O oh, seasons, booths, chaleur, dark-headed charlatans on the outskirts of some rural fete, the name you drop and never say is mine, mine. Someday I'll claim to you how all used up I am because of you, but in the meantime, the ride continues. Everyone is along for the ride, it seems. Besides, what else is there? The annual games. True, there are occasions for white uniforms and a special language kept secret from the others. The limes are duly sliced. I know all this, but can't seem to keep it from affecting me every day, all day. I've tried recreation, reading until late at night, train rides, and romance. One day a man called while I was out and left this message. You got the whole thing wrong from start to finish. Luckily, there's still time to correct the situation, but you must act fast. See me at your earliest convenience. And please tell no one of this. Much besides your life depends on it. I thought nothing of it at the time. Lately, I've been looking at old-fashioned plaids, fingering starched white collars, wondering whether there's a way to get them really white again. My wife thinks I'm in Oslo, Oslo, France, that is. <laughs> As I may have explained when I read that poem here a couple of years ago, I don't know, I still don't know whether there is an Oslo, France. People always ask me that. And, and I also don't have a wife, and these are both examples of poetic license, which <laughs> occurs throughout my poetry. So the, the speaker is quite distracted at the beginning of this poem. Um, neither reading nor recreation helps. And then things reach that even lower point in his life when he receives the worst review of his life. Only at the end of the poem, when he looks at old clothes and touches them, does he start to focus again, enough so that he's able to escape from any future distractions by lying to his wife about his whereabouts. Um, 
but but the point about the point his comment afterwards underscores um, is that the poem itself sounds so personal, offers such tantalizing details of a struggle with life that it's tempting to want to follow only those details. Ashbery's wry comment after reading the poem, his reminder to the audience that after only the first, it's the first poem of that reading, that the poem, his poetry in general, is the work of imagination, not, autobiog not autobiography, have their origins um, in his childhood thinking about art and autobiography. It's, it, it's not something that he, um, a lot of people have argued that, that his, his comments, um, his resistance to autobiography, his resistance to biography are a kind of anti-confessional poetry stance. Um, but, but you can really see looking back through his life how much he thought about this issue um, from the very moment that he got a diary. Um, from his earliest poem, The Battle, Ashbery had shown an instinctive sense that art wasn't or oughtn't be personal or confessional but that it existed in the realm of imagination. And perhaps one of the reasons that after such an impressive first poem, he didn't write another until he had spent a year writing a diary was because in the intervening period, he had become increasingly aware of how close the relationship between life and art actually were, since almost every artistic instinct that occurred to him once he had a diary did so as the result of some kind of social event, not some kind of poetic moment. Um, for example, he came to a generous, excited realization about what things ought to get included in a poem, an idea that had occurred in various forms to a lot of earlier moder modernist poets, um, but that Ashbery hadn't read yet at this point, though he would discover them quite soon. Marion Moore's famous 1921 declaration in the poem Poetry that poetry oughtn't, quote, discriminate against, I mean, oughtn't discriminate against, quote, business documents and school books, was a more didactic version of Ashbery's interest in including, even in hopefully introducing, mistakes into his writing. So for example, that mistake that occurred in the diary entry I read from February 20th, 1941, where he said, I got a painful scratch on the writer, pardon, listening to the radio, I mean scratch on my finger, was an early version of something he would actually encourage in his poetry. Um, in an unpublished essay on his creative process in 1977, he said, quote, I, was always, I, I always answer the phone while I am writing and tend to be more civil then than at other times, because whatever is said seems to play through or in the work in progress, either interrupting a train of thought that had gone on too long or supplying some important new element. This openness to surprise led him to discover to a discovery on, Mon on Monday evening, January 5th, 1942. During the day, he composed what he calls, quote, a rather dolorous poem, which he calls Miserare, to enclose with a letter to his cousin thanking him for a recent Christmas present. Then he decided he liked the poem well enough to want to preserve it by copying it into his diary. But instead of copying it as is, he writes it over again with an absurd ending. By moving the prologue, which had been the first stanza of the poem, to the end of the poem, though he left the title prologue in it, um, even though it's now at the end, the chain shifts the tone of the poem from anguished to funny simply by re reversing the expected order of the poem. I'll just read the poem's first stanza so you get a feeling of the mood that he was uh, going for in this poetic exercise. Ah, bleak and barren is the moor, the orphan girl she sheds a tear and thinks of home, her parents dear, departed from the worldly sphere full seven months ago. Um, so instead of the poem ending with the melodramatic, she died in agony, which is <laughs> what it had originally, um, and as a continuation of the feeling in that first stanza, it ends with the dryly self-conscious, so wrong. Shifting its genre, from sentimental Victorian melodrama to wry modernist comedy. Ashbery still hadn't been exposed to much modernist poetry at this point. His school textbook, McGraw-Hill's Poetry and Pose, Prose, edited in 1934, emphasized Victorian poetry over pretty much all other poetry. He had seen some surrealist art in Life magazine, but perhaps most important to this new flexibility in tone was his first long train trip three weeks before to visit Chicago as the winner of a local Quiz Kids radio show competition. Um, still under the glow of this local celebrity, and it really is amazing. I've done a lot of interviews in the last year or so with people who still live in Sodus and Pulteneyville who knew him, and it's the first thing that they mentioned was, do I know that he won this um, Quiz Kids competition 70 years ago? Um, so with a new, perhaps a new sense um, of, his, of his future and, and the fu a future that would be in a, in a bigger world, he's emboldened to write a poem that breaks with the conventions he has learned in school by bringing ex being extremely unsentimental, rather perversely funny, and overtly at odds with readers' expectations for order and mood. 
By the following year, he articulates what has been pretty much an instinctive practice to himself with new clarity and insight, realizing that in writing poetry, he is drawn much more to the emotional resonances of life than any specifics about his own. This understanding first occurs to him as a result of what he considers an unexpected social coup. Um, he's sitting in Soda's High School Library on June 2nd, 1943, the end of his junior year of high school, and a girl Ashbury has admired, admired from afar as pretty, but whose tastes tend to run, as he puts it, to, quote, brawny men, surprises him by sitting next, down next to him and spending the entire class period in conversation. This pleasant and highly unusual occurrence stirs him up, and later he writes about the details of the day in his diary, but as usual, he's embarrassed by the silliness of, of what happened and the silliness of the small details of his life. And he realizes that what he wants to write about is how he feels about it, not, not what happened. Um, so he, he realizes something. He writes in his diary, quote, I feel almost like writing a poem about it, but using generalized terms. Soon after, he writes this poem, which is dated June 1943. It's called In the Garden. It's one, it's one quatrain. Each afternoon when sunlight gilds the grass and willows spread blue, flan blue fans against the wall, I think, perhaps all this will never pass. Perhaps this once, the evening, will not fall. This brief poem about the length of most of the poems he was writing at the time does what he hoped. It captures an early summer mood, a wish for timelessness, along with a no some knowledge that it won't last. It's just about the mood, the experience of the conversation generated that early June, not a personal recounting, and it satisfies the goal he had made for himself. Ashbury was proud of what he wrote, and he copied the poem and all the other poems that he had written um, that spring neatly into a clean spiral notebook, added a table of contents, mm -hmm. and then gave the book to his favorite Sotus English teacher, his first unofficial volume. And he didn't look at that poem or any other that he had written during that productive period of writing in Sodas for five years. During that time, his life changed with the kind of swiftness he describes in The Lone Dale Operator, so thoroughly that he completely forgot he ever even wrote the poem or any volume of poems or had ever given it to anybody. Um, in the fall of 1943, at the age of 16, a family friend decided that someone as bright as Ashbury needed a better, better education, and she helped to send him with a substantial scholarship to Deerfield Academy for his final two years of high school. At Deerfield, he took his first course in poetry during his senior year there, and he wrote two poems, both of which would end up in Poetry Magazine. As a freshman at Harvard, he took another poetry writing seminar with Theodore Spencer, and he also began to write for The Advocate from the very moment it started back up in the spring of his sophomore year after its hiatus for the war, and other reasons, but mostly for the war. Perhaps even more important than school was what he found to read on his own. Early on, he discovered um, the poetry of Moore, Crane, Dickinson, Auden, Rambeau. A little later, during Harvard, he added Stevens and Bishop. Um, this is not a complete list, but, but some of the most important poets. He read every single E.M. Forster novel, lots of Trollope, Dickens, Hardy, and he came to admire Henry James enormously and as the only writer other than occasionally Kafka that he could read or wanted to read while he was writing poetry. Ashbury's poems became longer and more complex in this period, but he still felt somewhat plagued by his old questions of how much of himself to be, how much of himself to put in his poems, the subject of so many of his ruminations back at Sodus. In 1947, while at Harvard, um, short, shortly after his grandmother passed away, he wrote a poem for the advocate called Grandma, but he couldn't decide whether to put Death, 1947, underneath the title or not. And there are tons of drafts of the poem, actually, at the, in Ashbury's papers at the Houghton Library. And in almost every, um, every draft, the death date is either crossed out or put back in. Um, he just couldn't decide yet how overtly autobiographical to make the poem. So just before final exams in May 1948, Ashbury decided that he was going to devote himself to writing better poems over the summer. So this was right after his junior year at Harvard. Um, he seemed, and it seemed that to him that in order to do so, he ought to avoid spending another dull summer back at Sodus. But a plan he'd hatched to get a job in New York City and spend the summer there with friends fell through almost immediately on arriving in the city, and he ended up having to wire his parents for money just to get home. Um, then four days after arriving in Sodus, while reluctantly attending a dinner party for an old Sodus friend, he met his former English teacher, who gave him back the spiral notebook of his 1943 poems that he had completely forgotten about, um, work that he hadn't seen or thought about in five years. He went home that night and read all of the poems and declared them completely embarrassing. Um, 
and that's it, I mean, that's his quote. But reading them set in motion the writing of the painter, his, very, his first mature poem and the very earliest poem he wrote that ended up in his first published volume, Some Trees. Writing the poem really began the process of learning to write the kinds of poems he would write for the next eight years, um, and, that he, and that he ended up publishing in Some Trees. And it also revised his questions for him about the relationship between art and autobiography. Here's one of the very rare recordings of Ashbery reading the painter um, in 1988. As far as I know, there's only two recordings. The painter, sitting between the sea and the buildings, he enjoyed painting the sea's portrait. But just as children imagine a prayer as merely silence, he expected his subject to rush up the sand and, seizing a brush, plaster its own portrait on the canvas. So there was never any paint on his canvas until the people who lived in the buildings put him to work. Try using the brush as a means to an end. Select for a portrait something less angry and large and more subject to a painter's moods or perhaps to a prayer. How could he explain to them his prayer that nature, not art, might usurp the canvas? He chose his wife for a new subject, making her vast, like ruined buildings, as if, forgetting itself, the portrait had expressed itself without a brush. Slightly encouraged, he dipped his brush in the sea, murmuring a heartfelt prayer. My soul, when I paint this next portrait, let it be you who wrecks the canvas. The news spread like wildfire through the buildings, he had gone back to the sea for his subject. Imagine a painter crucified by his subject, too exhausted even to lift his brush. He provoked some artists leaning from the buildings to malicious mirth. We have in a prayer now of putting ourselves on canvas or getting the sea to sit for a portrait. Others declared it a self-portrait. Finally, all indications of a subject began to fade leaving the canvas perfectly white. He put down the brush. At once, a howl that was also a prayer arose from the overcrowded buildings. They tossed him the portrait from the tallest of the buildings, and the sea devoured the canvas and the brush as though his subject had decided to remain a prayer. The Sistina just poured out of him. Um, on the afternoon of June 17, 1948, at home in his bed in sodas with a slight fever and no other symptoms, suffering from a kind of poetic flu that had lasted for two days and from which he recovered as soon as he finished writing the poem. The draft in Ashbury's papers at the Houghton Library indicate that he made only a few, mostly minor changes from the first draft to the final, but one of the few suggestions of his relative youth as a poet is in a marginal series of numbers he noted next to the envoy as he figured out the order in which to place the final six words. Nonetheless, in every way, this poem represented an astonishing jump in his poetic development. Luckily, though, a number of letters from the period survive, as well as a brief month-long diary, the first he kept since 1944. Together, these provide a record of the intense process of study and thought that led up to the writing of the poem. As he had expected, the abrupt change from the, his busy, full school and social life at Harvard to life at home depressed him. A week earlier, he had been at the Signet Society, watching Kenneth Koch and another friend get into a heated debate about Auden's sexuality and religious beliefs, and then stayed out late playing writing games with friends. Back at home, he sat alone in his soda's bedroom, watching the cherry, tree, cherry trees bloom, or rested on the beach in Pulteneyville, gazing once more on his childhood view of Lake Ontario with no friends and no plans. Yet it was the weird familiarity of this old experience of farm and lake after such a complete break from it that heightened his sense of alertness to his potential as raw material for writing. His diaries had always been full of complaints about feeling bored. In 1941, he frequently reported that he was, quote, doing nothing. Later that year, he noticed he made the same comment so often that he wittily altered the refrain to, quote, I have often observed that nothing ever happens to me on Tuesday. Not wanting to indulge these old feelings, he begins to read Proust, um, which he has tried to read before but has never gotten very far in. But he has a practical re reason for trying again because he knows he's going to take Harry Levin's Lit 161 course on Proust, Joyce, and Mann in the fall. And he starts to read Proust in an entirely new way. Quote, I savor him, reading him very slowly. It's all so beautiful. But I don't remember hearing anyone say that. People just say he's morbid. 
It is on the day that he finally starts reading Proust well, four days after returning home, that he encounters his younger writing self when Miss Klump returns that spiral notebook. The next day, he's still upset about how embarrassing the poems are, and he wonders how to improve, thinking about how to accomplish for his own experience a version of what he sees Proust as having accomplished. I've been keeping this diary for a month now, he says. What a lot of junk I've recorded. Perhaps I should try to copy down my thoughts if I could make something beautiful of them as Proust does. My aim has been to furnish myself with an outline of my ideas without copying them down. This self-recrimination is also a reiteration of the principle he had articulated in his diary in June 1943, the desire to create art that substituted general and abstract emotional truths for specific details about his life. As he had realized as a young diarist, the sense of compulsion in keeping a diary to record life just as it happened was the very antithesis to producing the kind of beautiful poetry he had hoped to create. But though he understood what he wanted to do, he didn't yet know quite how to do it. He didn't know how to write the poem that he had in mind. Within a week, though, he had figured out how to write a poem with a genuine feeling of his childhood world in it, but that was in no way about his own childhood. The poem, P The Painter, opens with a view of the lake. It used, it, it's the view of his lake. It used his desire to become a painter as a, as a means to explore imagination and experimentation, and it revisited his old feelings of boredom through the pattern of repetition demanded by the Sistina form. And though the poem resonated with his childhood sensibility, and in fact, his only revision to it was to improve the sentence beginning in line three, um, which is the only one that contains the word children in it, its narrative of artistic effort and failure elevated his longtime concern about the relationship between art and life, between confession and abstraction, to the subject of art, as he had long wanted to do. The poem re represented a real breakthrough for Ashbery, and he knew it. He recopied the poem several times during the next few days and sent it off to friends. And in the week after writing it, while reading Coleridge's Kubla Khan, he continued to think about what his own poem was about and what he had accomplished. The word build at the end of Coleridge's poem reminded him of his earliest summers in Pulteneyville. Quote, in the last stanza of, Col of Coleridge's poem, the, world bi the, wor the word build seems to me tremendous and coincides with an impression I had when looking at the creek in back of Grandpa's tonight of how when I was young, my first thought would have been, how can I build a raft so as to be able to float down the creek and enjoy it to the fullest extent? Enjoy here equals build. He sees the origin of his poem, especially the first image of the painter enjoying himself as he sits alone in front of the sea, happy to be painting, in his childhood sense of play, understanding the significance of this close connection between his childhood and art, his past and his future, completely, at this moment at least. Ashbury's next poem, Some Trees Turned Away from the Sense of the Past, that he had discovered, um, both had to put in and leave out of the painter. And the process by which he wrote that new poem couldn't have been more different than the anguish and illness out of which the painter emerged. Written almost exactly five months after the painter, on Tuesday, November 16, 1948, in the evening in his dorm room at Dunster House, it was really the very first great poem he wrote at Harvard. It's a true Harvard poem. According to his roommate at the time, um, Ashbury sat down at his desk, uh, scribbled away for about an hour, and turned around and said, would you like to read a poem I just wrote? And th that's this poem, Some Trees. So I'll play it. I'll read between uh, 45 and 50 and minutes and an hour, somewhere around in there. I thought I'd start with a few early poems. Uh, This uh, one is Some Trees is, ac is actually the earliest uh, poem of mine that I've kept, I think, except perhaps for one other called The Painter. And I wrote it when I was an undergraduate here in uh, 1948. Some Trees. These are amazing, each joining a neighbor, as though speech were a still performance arranging by chance to meet as far this morning from the world as agreeing with it, you and I are, what, are suddenly what the trees try to tell us we are, that their merely being there means something that soon we may touch, love, explain. And glad not to have invented such comeliness, we are surrounded, a silence already filled with noises, a canvas on which emerges a chorus of smiles a winter morning, placed in a puzzling light and moving, 
Our days put on such reticence, these accents seem their own defense. So perhaps one explanation for the speed with which he was able to write the poem emerges from some of its surface similarities to the painter. Both poems are about the desire to create and to communicate something and a sense that doing so involves feeling awed by nature. The painter sits in front of that expanse of sea. The lovers in some trees are surrounded by the amazing trees. In both poems, the artists seem small and passive at first. They seem to wait to be told who they are, and they wait for art to emerge onto their canvases. But the two poems end quite differently. The painter ends by the unasked for audience tossing everything into the sea, violently objecting to the painter's experimental canvas, that perfectly white canvas. Um, some trees ends more resolutely. The canvas emerges covered with, quote, a chorus of smiles, a winter morning. Perhaps as one critic of the poem has commented, this vision of art is inexplicable, but it is also a, clearly a vision of a work of art to puzzle over in the future, and that functions as its own defense of itself. No third party reacts negatively to it. No one is watching. Um, there's no tradition against which it is being compared. There seems to be no past at all in this poem. Even when the inclusion of the modest words seem in the final line, these accents seem their own defense, suggest a much more decisive conclusion about art as its own response than the painter had reached. Ashbury made two significant revisions to some trees between his first dorm draft, which is approximately the version that he published in the Harvard Advocate, and the one that he published later in some trees. These changes offer some insight into the direction of his poetry was moving and that the intense process of writing and analyzing the painter in Sodas had set in motion. Both changes to some trees make the poem seem more impersonal, colder, resolute, which I think is an aspect of his poetry of the, of the time. Um, first in the third stanza, the description of the trees had originally been, you and I are suddenly what the trees are, what the trees try to tell us we are, that our being here means something. So the our and here were the original words. Then he changed them both to there, T-H-E-I-R and then T-H-E-R-E, -E, which emphasize a sense of the dist uh, distance, greater distance between the lovers and the trees. The other change he made is at the end of the poem, and it underscored the narrative of some trees as a defense of art. In the original draft, the word accent had been errors. Um, accents linked that line not only to the decorative smiles that emerged on the canvas, but also just to syllables, um, the fun most fundamental pieces of words. Some Trees, which was an important enough statement about poetry to give his first official volume um, its title, focused on art and language, very much eager to exclude the kind of self-analysis or glancing at the past that had enabled Ash Ashbery to write the painter. The childhood world that he had needed to understand in order to refer to it so obliquely in the painter was all but squeezed out of the poems that followed, um, which were resolutely set in the present and thinking about the future. So I found in writing a biography of Ashbery's early life that the narrative of his childhood is also very much the narrative of his constant rejection of some of that experience as material for poetry. So I, I want to end this talk with the poem in which Ashbery puts these concerns about art and autobiography, about what it means to remember and how to use memory as an artist into the mind of an artist. This poem is Ashbery's Orpheus retelling, Syringa, from Houseboat Days in 1977. In the poem, Ashbery uses the Orpheus myth to think about how an artist navigates the experiences and memories of his own well-known past, learning how to use the past without losing himself in it in order to create something new. The poem ends with a glimpse of Ashbury's feelings for soda so long ago, a very brief glance that offers a moment of relief, a familiar place to rest, in a poem that suggests it is almost as difficult to go backwards as it is to go forwards. And here's Syringa. The title of this one is Syringa. Orpheus liked the glad personal quality of the things beneath the sky. Of course, Eurydice was a part of this. Then one day, everything changed. He rends rocks into fissures with lament. Gullies, hummocks can't withstand it. The sky shudders from one horizon to the other, almost ready to give up wholeness. Then Apollo quietly told him, leave it all on earth. Your loot, what point? Why pick it a dull pavan few care to follow, except a few birds of dusty feather? not vivid performances of the past. But why not? All other things must change, too. The seasons are no longer what they once were. But it is the nature of things to be seen only once, 
as they happen along, bumping into other things, getting along somehow. That's where Orpheus made his mistake. Of course Eurydice vanished into the shade. She would have even if he hadn't turned around. No use standing there like a gray stone toga as the whole wheel of recorded history flashes past, struck dumb, unable to utter an intelligent comment on the most thought-provoking element in its train. Only love stays on the brain, and something these people, these other ones, call life. Singing accurately so that the notes mount straight up out of the well of dim noon and rival the tiny, sparkling yellow flowers growing around the brink of the quarry encapsulizes the different weights of the things. But it isn't enough to just go on singing. Orpheus realized this and didn't mind so much about his reward being in heaven after the Bacantes had torn him apart, driven half out of their minds by his music, what it was doing to them. Some say it was for his treatment of Eurydice, but probably the music had more to do with it. And the way music passes, emblematic of life, and how you cannot isolate a note of it, just as you cannot isolate a moment of life and say it is good or bad. You must wait till it's over. The end crowns all, meaning also that the tableau is wrong. For although memories of a season, for example, melt into a single snapshot, one cannot guard, treasure that stalled moment. It too is flowing, fleeting. It is a picture of flowing, scenery, the living, mortal, over which an abstract action is laid out in blunt, harsh strokes. And to ask more than this is to become the tossing reeds of that slow, powerful stream, the trailing grasses playfully tugged at, but to participate in the action no more than this. Then in the lowering gentian sky, electric twitches are faintly apparent first, then burst forth into a shower of fixed cream-colored flares. The horses have each seen a share of the truth, though each thinks, I'm a maverick. Nothing of this is happening to me. Though I can understand the language of birds and the itinerary of the lights caught in the storm is fully apparent to me. Their jousting ends in music, much as trees move more easily in the wind after a summer storm and is happening in lacy shadows of shore trees now day after day. But how late to be regretting all this, even bearing in mind that regrets are always late, too late, to which Orpheus, a bluish cloud with white contours, replies that these are, of course, not regrets at all, merely a careful, scholarly setting down of unquestioned facts, a record of pebbles along the way. And no matter how all this disappeared or got where it was going, it is no longer material for a poem. Its subject matters too much and not enough, standing there helplessly while the poem streaked by its tail of fire, a bad comet screaming hate and disaster, but so turned inward that the meaning, good or other, can never become known. The singer thinks constructively, builds up his chant in progressive stages, like a skyscraper, but at the last minute turns away. The song is engulfed in an instant in blackness, which must in turn flood the whole continent with blackness, for it cannot see. The singer must then pass out of sight, not even relieved of the evil burthen of the words. Stellification is for the few and comes about much later, when all record of these people and their lives has disappeared into libraries onto microfilm. A few are still interested in them. But what about so-and-so is still asked on occasion. But they lie frozen and out of touch until an arbitrary chorus speaks of a totally different incident with a similar name in whose tale are hidden syllables of what happened so long before that in some small town one indifferent summer. I'll just mention the title, by the way, is a kind of plant shrub. And um, last year I had an interview with Ashbury in Rochester. We were just driving around the neighborhoods, and he, he with no reference to the poem whatsoever, he just kept pushing, put, um, pointing out every syringa bush that, <laughs> that, that, there, that there was. Um, but the poem raises the subject of the relationship between art and autobiography to a mythic level. And then it also makes fun of the myth. 
Um, it begins, Orpheus liked the glad personal quality of the things beneath the sky. A wry response to any comment about whether Ashbery's poems are or aren't autobiographical. Of course, everything or Orpheus sees feels personal to him. And the poem continues to retell Orpheus's story by bluntly undercutting its sentimentality. Doesn't Orpheus realize that what ought to have been obvious to him, which is the nature of things to be seen only once. He should have known that, quote, of course Eurydice vanished into the shade. She would have even if he hadn't, tur if he hadn't turned around. Yet dis despite the seeming disrespect of the myth, Orpheus has a lot of good things to say in the poem, not about the fact that the past vanishes, which is obvious, but about the process by which it does that. For he recognizes that the, th that the way time moves forward is very different from the way memory shifts. Everything changes, he says. There's nothing we experience that isn't flowing or fleeting. Which is why, as Orpheus later explains, the finished poem is always just out of reach, moving too fast, leaving behind its material, or the poet or the subject, only discovering what it was looking for or what it needed by accident. For example, when one sees a movie from long ago, like in A Lone Dale Operator, or at the end of this poem, hears a voice that, re that reveals those hidden syllables of what happened long before that in some small town, one indifferent summer. Sotus isn't named, but the image of the place is vivid, familiar, comforting. Orpheus, who can't help looking back even though he suffers for it, eventually reaches some sense of peace. Like Ashbery, who struggled as a maturing writer to learn how to use his sense of the past as an animating but not a limiting force in his poems, Orpheus accepts that all he can do to create art in the future is to encapsulate, quote, the different weights of things by singing accurately and hope that he will do it well enough that a song or a syllable he has uttered will be worth remembering. Thank you. I think, yeah, no, I think, um, I think it's gotten a little easier over the last couple of years. Um, I mean, he gave me permission to write this biography and other people had asked and he hadn't. And so, but it wasn't, it wasn't just me. I mean, it, it was the point that in his life, you can see in his poetry, he's just become so much more open in his poetry. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if I'd asked as the very same person 10 years ago, I wouldn't have gotten this, the same answer. But, um, but I mean, he looked at his diaries after I, he handed them to me when, when I, I realized that they existed and I realized that they were probably in the house and, and asked them if, and he knew where they were and he handed them to me and, and um, said, okay, yeah, they're stupid, you know, take them home. And, you know, I spent the whole weekend completely worried that my house was going to burn down and I was going to lose this, like, unbelievable um, archive of his, his life. And, and uh, anyway, when I get, after I, I wrote the essay and I, I my first essay about it, and I, I gave him um, back the diaries. I know he went back and looked a little bit in them, and that was the first time. And I think it was okay at that point to to look at the diaries for him. I mean, he didn't read them cover to cover, but but a little bit. Um, and then, I mean, I think he, he has real resistance, genuine resistance. Um, to looking at his life too closely in the way that it, um, since so much of his poetry is about memory and about the necessity of forgetting as much as even, or even more than the necessity of remembering. I think that one of the problems of writing a biography about somebody is that you might make them remember things that um, had existed in a better way, not quite accurately remembered. Mm -hmm. That said, um, you know, I mentioned that, that for the last year or so I've done a ton of interviews up at SOTUS and really just found all these people that he hadn't talked to or known in a really long time. And um, I had an interview with him in, in December that was really a very different kind of interview um, where we were just sort of talking about people um, rather than an interview. Um, and and it, was, it was probably the best interview um, that I've had with him in terms of just sort of getting a sense of his feelings about the past in a kind of 
non-resistant way. How did you meet him? How did you begin the project? Um, I was a visiting assistant professor at Bard as my first job after grad school, and I was teaching his poetry. He was there at the time still as a, not, not specifically teaching any classes, but supposedly you were allowed to ask him to visit classes, and <laughs> so I did, and that's how I met him. That was in 2005. You mean his own readings? Yeah. Oh. He reads his poetry. Oh, that that's or interesting. If you reflect about it at all, right? I mean, I don't mean well, I mean, he talks about it all the time, right? I mean, and there was a, that recent time uh, interview that was online where it was like ten questions for John Ashbery or something, and he talked about, you know, yet again how much he hates his own the sound of his own voice, and um, and and the flatness of it, and and in fact, um, there there's a a record uh, a reading that he did. 60 years ago today at the 92nd Street Y, and it's on my iPad and my iPod. And I, he, I was in a car with him, and he wanted to hear it, and um, because he wanted to hear his voice. And really, it's a much stronger accent than he has now. And we were discussing how much his voice has mellowed since then. But, um, but it's interesting what you say because I have had the exact opposite reaction. That the somehow the the flatness of listening to him read, I find really it's so helpful to kind of make connections between some of the places in the poems that on the page seem like jumps. Um, but maybe because of the similarity of the way that he reads all the way through, um, it sounds much more of a piece, like a, of a whole. And one other thing, I guess, is when he gave the Norton Lecture here, here he talked a lot at the beginning of those Norton Lectures about the difference between literary essays, which he was sort of giving in that talk, and then also um, poetry, which he thinks of entirely as spoken language. I mean, that he really thinks about writing in the idiom of speaking. So um, I, I think that maybe is part of also why I find that there, there's a kind of casualness to the way that he gives readings that um, fits the voices, even though there are many voices, but the voices in the poems. Thank you. Thank you.